everyone Jardula here and also Johnny Sue is spinning on the ones and twos ladies and gentlemen we had some crazy stuff that just broke out in the Middle Eastern region of Azerbaijan and Armenia an old conflict reunited so to get the right answers to get to the truth we brought in our foreign policy expert Mr. Mark Sloboda how you doing there Mark hey pasta thanks for having me it's always an honor and a pleasure to be on the conversation couch you know, you went back to it. I love it when you call us the conversation couch. That is Mark Sloboda's nickname for us. And hey, man, I think this is the fourth or fifth time on the show. We love when you come on here and you really explain to us what's going on in these regions. Uh, you're an expert at it. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things today. Uh, we're going to talk about Azerbaij uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. But first, okay, first, Armenia and Azerbaijan are not in the Middle East. See, They're I knew in the it was going to happen. Where is it at? The Caucasus. South of Russia. That's not the Middle East. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for it's correcting between, us because... In between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, the Caucasus. <laughs> that's the Caucasus. See, see, we already learned something here from Professor Sloboda because I was like, no, that's the mi Middle East over there. I'm pretty sure it is because uh, we were trying to determine, is it Eastern Europe? Is it the Middle East? It is the Caucasus. All right. But before we get to the Caucasus, let's talk really quickly about Belarus. A lot of stuff's going on there. Uh, people have been protesting for seven weeks now. However, this last protest on Sunday, the anti-government protest, seemed to be a little bit less than the previous protest before them. And now we're also seeing reports about the opposition in this thing called Black Book Belarus, which has been releasing data on personal and personal information about of 2,000 police officers and a few others who don't agree necessarily with the opposition. Um, in fact, their policy is if you're not with us, then you're kind of against us. Are you surprised these protests have lasted that long there? But more importantly, what effects will these new tactics have by the opposition on everyday Belarusians? Okay. Um, so uh, there is legitimate, genuine, sincere, significant percentage of the Belarusian people that are not happy with the official election results, which... Uh, gave an 80% win to uh, Lukashenko mm -hmm. um, and uh, some 10% to Svetlana Tihanovskaya, which was the major opposition candidate that was left allowed to remain on the, banet, uh, the uh, uh, ballot. Um, the election was already, shall we say, unfair because numerous other candidates, uh, including much more popular uh opposition candidates that were regarded in the Western press as pro-Russian, uh, Viktor Babarko, who was the uh, Belarusian uh, head of Gazprom Bank uh, in Belarus, Sergei Tsipkalo, who was a previous Belarusian ambassador to the U.S. Uh, he also opened uh, basically the tech park that started Belarus's big IT economy. Yeah, they do have a big IT economy. Um, basically, these candidates were removed from the ballot because they were serious establishment candidates um, who were regarded as pro-Russian and thus a much more serious threat on the ballot to Lukashenko. He also removed a uh, liberal blogger who was the husband of Svetlana Tihanovskaya. Mm -hmm. She then went on the ballot. His wife, who was a housewife, a stay-at-home mother, uh, went on the ballot. He left her on the ballot because he thought that no one would turn out, would, would support someone as unqualified as her against him. Well, large numbers of people did. Okay, We don't know what the actual result of the election was, right? whether he won in a nail biter, whether he actually lost, whether it was still a significant, but no one in Russia or the West really believes that he won by 80%. Uh, so the election was, was, in Sergei Lavrov's words, uh, less than perfect. But um, this started a series of protests um, uh, that have continued to this day. Um, Svetlana Tihanovskaya, meanwhile, uh, has fled to the EU and created a shadow government in Lithuania. Yeah. Um, Lithuania has recognized her in John Guaido style as the legitimate 
president of Belarus. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. she's the new Wang that, Guaido. Wang Guaido. <laughs> the, the election was rigged, but it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, second place officially on a rigged election that already had legitimate candidates kicked off the ballot does not necessarily make her the president. It does make her a significant opposition leader. But the EU is basically full throating denying, uh, you know, uh, the official Belarusian results. They are denying that Lukashenko is the president. They're saying uh, Lithuania specifically, a few others uh, de facto are saying that that she is the, the president. She's spoken to the EU parliament. She's met with U.S. State Department uh, uh, people. Um, she's even posed for pictures with regime change celebrity Bernard Henry Levy. Uh, and she's called for sanctions, not only against the Belarusian government, but now against Belarusian companies that are seen as supporting the president. Uh, and um, Russia, while sympathizing with the protesters and having no great love for Lukashenko, there's no love loss between Putin and Lukashenko. Um, there is a Belarusian-Russian union state uh, that has been on the books since 1998. Um, it's basically meant to be something uh, akin to the EU or to the African Union. Uh, already, there's no you don't need a visa to go back and forth between countries. There's no customs duties. You can live and work in the other countries. Even each other's uh, intelligence and security services operate freely on both sides of the border. But the economic integration was supposed to go further. And Russia had long subsidized Belarus's heavy state-driven socialist economy with cheap energy. Yeah. Uh, with Lukashenko flirting with the West, dragging his feet on, integra on further integration with the Union state, Russia said, all right, well, we don't see any reason then to continue this energy subsidization of your economy um, unless you want to continue to integrate economically further. And uh, that led to an economic crisis in the lead up to the election where suddenly Belarus's economic miracle where they didn't suffer the uh, neoliberal shock therapy of the 1990s uh, looked under severe threat. And that was coupled with Lukashenko's boorish Trumpian reaction to the coronavirus crisis, where he said it was just a flu and that Belarusians could just drive tractors, drink vodka and play hockey, and that would protect them didn't protect him. He actually came down with it and recovered. Uh, but he's been in power for 26 years. And even with the threat that with him gone, mass privatizations would unemploy lots of people, there is a definite degree of Lukashenko fatigue. And the one thing that no one can deny is that whatever the actual numbers of the opposition, they're larger than they ever have before. That's true. Now, right after the election, the protests started, uh, they started a series of, uh, they called for nationwide strikes. And nationwide strikes were potentially, particularly in state companies, and state company employees are viewed as Lukashenko's blue collar base. Um, if they had continued, that would have been a much more serious threat to his uh, regime than uh, uh, street protests uh, in Minsk. But they didn't. The, secure, the, uh, the strikes have ended. Uh, they ended uh, already a couple months ago. The protests have been slowly getting smaller. There is a heavy handed police presence not unlike the response to Black Lives Matter in the U.S. Uh, that's uh, or, um, you know, Catalonia uh, referendum in Spain. It's that level of, of, of police militarization and brutality. Um, but um, the um, security services, the police, all the institutions and organs of the state and power continue to back Lukashenko. So it doesn't seem that there's any room right now for the opposition to uh, gain power. Uh, the protests have been mostly peaceful from the protesters' size. It has been not violent like the Ukraine. Uh, the Belarusian people don't have this national identity divide uh, and, and this uh, the anti-Russian 
um, mentality that West Ukrainians had, uh, this ultra-nationalism, anti-Russian ultra-nationalism that West Ukrainians had, that doesn't exist. So it's not really a Maidan situation. What Russia is afraid of is this Svetlana Tihanovskaya and this cabal, this liberal shadow government around her could essentially hijack the protests, which are about Lukashenko, not against Russia, but then use that to uh, geopolitically flip uh, Belarus basically over the heads of the Belarusian people, the protesters that don't necessarily have an anti-Russian attitude. So Russia has given Lukashenko some really tepid conditional support, basically kept him on a lifeline saying, we won't not recognize you. And that's about the extent of the support he's gotten. But they've also made him, pushed him towards a public commitment he made towards constitutional reform leading to new elections within a couple years, at which they hope to see uh, pro-Russian, popular pro-Russian establishment candidates on the ballot. So they're basically giving him time uh, to get a honorable departure from office um, without the threat of street revolution leading to an outcome something like uh, what happened in Ukraine. Well, you know, it really reminds me of a Hong Kong situation where there is some legitimacy to getting into the streets. I mean, yeah. There was a lot of austerity measures. Right now, they hit a little bit of a poor streak. The, the poor handling of the corona really propped this up. But the main mechanism that the West does to throw the actual fuel on the fire is they use these NGOs you know, and the media to really continuously get people in the streets. How much longer can these NGOs keep these people driving into the streets? Or is it the, the fact that Lukashenko just has to make that one, um, <clears throat> that one uh, compromisation and get those reforms into the constitution of Belarus? Yeah, so, I mean, the Russian intelligence has reported that the U.S. has shoveled some $20 million uh, into these NGOs and and so on. And U.S. state media, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, um, has been in overdrive. Uh, Actually, the main tool of organization of these protests has actually been out of telegram channels. A yep. mobile phone app that is used to get around the the Belarusian government shutting the internet, and these Telegram channels are all arranged out of Poland, and Poland uh, and Ukraine and the Baltics are seen as the ones that are really taking the fore lead in kind of the uh, the regime change effort, and it is a soft regime change. It's not as as overt as we saw in Ukraine with Victoria Nuland hanging, handing out cookies on, uh, in Ukraine and, um, you know, basically orchestrating the next Ukrainian government, uh, behind the scenes. And well, no, she got permission uh, from Joe Biden. So it's okay, funny. Mark. So he gave the thumbs up. But these protests in Belarus, again, they do have legitimate, there is legitimate, uh, you know, portion of the population, uh, and, and they've been out there, you know, once or twice a week, uh, for the last, you know, seven, uh, 17 weeks we're going on now. Uh, there's, there's very, um, there's a degree of sympathy for them, but with the people at the top s- seen as the, the next leader of this, because of this ballot, this, uh, Svetlana Tihanovskaya, there's, there's fear from Russia that the U S is using her to hijack the protests and uh, get you know the geopolitical results they want, which is you know t- turning uh, uh, Belarus like Ukraine into a de facto NATO base with with military forces pointed right at the Russian heartland. Yeah, I mean I think Belarus is very is uh, you know somebody in our chat just said it. Uh, thank you for people watching on the Rockfin. And the Belarus uh, is an oppressive government, somewhat just like Syria. However, it's not going to make it any better if the West comes in. In fact, he even says the top priority must be to stop imperialism, and I feel the same way. Um, however, you know, I mean, it's uh, what about Belarus's backing from Russia right now? How much support did Putin give Lukashenko right now? And what is also your take on Macron? weighing in on Lukashenko. 
Okay, Macron has weighed in around the world. He's weighed in on who the Lebanese government should be, who the Libyan government be should be. Assad must go. Lukashenko must go. You know what? As Lukashenko rightly pointed out, hey, why didn't you step down for the yellow vest? Exactly. Macron must go. <laughs> this, this little Napoleon thinks he's some type of emperor of the world or some type of Kissinger finger. You know what? You've got what, a 20% approval rating in your own country on a good day? Yeah, stay in France. Stay in France. Worry about your own domestic concerns. Try Stop trying to distract from your domestic problems with what's going on all the way on the other side of Europe and in, in, in Belarus. Russian support has been really limited. Um, Putin did have a meeting with Lukashenko. They did officially recognize the results, but after Lukashenko was inaugurated in essentially a quiet ceremony that yeah, protesters that. weren't allowed to know about, Putin did not congratulate him after the inauguration. And in fact, the Russian presidential spokesman specifically when asked said no. We, uh, the, Putin did not congratulate him and has no intention to. Um, after the meeting with, with, with Putin and Lukashenko, um, uh, Lukashenko said that he had asked Russia for new arms, right, with the idea that that there's an imminent NATO invasion, which is also a falsehood. It's it's soft covert, uh, soft power covert stuff, not not a NATO invasion. And the Russian government responded, "No, we didn't talk about weapons, and we're not giving any more to Belarus." So the whole recognition of Lukashenko's elect re-election as president. Uh, for his sixth term was put in terms that it's basically conditional on further Russian, Russian Belarusian integration. And if they don't see movement on that, then Lukashenko might be shuffled off the stage a lot sooner. And the sorry truth is if, if this major opposition housewife, Svetlana Tihanovskaya, if she had come to Moscow instead of Lithuania, and she had asked to speak to the Russian Duma and uh, Putin instead of the EU parliament and US State Department people, she'd probably be in the Belarusian presidential palace right now. Uh, but the West let that happen if she went that way. I think the West the, would then say, uh uh uh, you're with us or against us. Yeah, well, yeah, well, they might say that, but the truth is that, that the West has very limited leverage here. They're trying. Yeah. But the Belarusian economy. Uh, you know, not just the energy subsidization, but basically the majority of what Belarus produces. Russia is is their major economic uh, partner. Russia yeah. is part of a military or Belarus is part of a military alliance analogous to NATO with Russia, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Russia and Belarus even have an integrated air defense network. All right, the two countries are to a very significant degree not already two separate countries. They're in a gray area in between. And yeah. uh, the U.S. would really like, of course, to geopolitically flip Belarus, but uh, you know uh, the cards don't look like they're on the table for that right now. Russia seems to have uh, you know, greater influence uh, on whether Lukashenko will remain president and exactly for how long, yeah. which I think if the Kremlin has their way, it, it won't be a full next term, that is for sure. I think, you know, that was the whole thing. Like, it, people were trying to connect the dots and saying Lukashenko was a Putin puppet of sorts at first, but no, no. Lukashenko has had his, his beef. He even said not too long ago that Putin used to be my brother. Now he's just simply my partner. So yeah. my question is, what do you think the future holds for Lukashenko? Was, was this his last run, or do you think he'll... Oh, Try yeah, to run for president I, I don't think again. there's any question of that. I mean, he does not have a lot of legitimacy rest. There's there's no question he's still got his support within the country, right? Uh, you know, the state companies, he's kept Belarus from, the, you know, the, the, the collapse that the rest of the former Soviet Union suffered in the 90s that Ukraine is still suffering from today. But 26 years is enough. He's lost his popular support, or at least a significant degree of it. And Russia uh, support right now is very tepid uh, and, um, you know, conditional. They would like to see him go. Uh, but they just want it under controlled conditions. And they want the Belarusian people to have a real 
full legitimate ballot where pro-Russian candidates, Lukashenko was actually really clever there by removing all the more popular opposition establishment credentialed uh, uh, candidates like Babarko, like uh, Tsepkalo. Uh, Russia had no one to turn to to support in Belarus. Uh, it was either the liberal blogger's wife or Lukashenko. That was that was all that was left at the moment, right? Yeah. But Russia, I think, is will try to have him retire with some degree of saving face, whether that is to uh, Russia or or you know uh, you know some other related country, you know Kazakhstan, where he's he's given a um, a, a safe sinecure, uh, you know, for retirement there. I think it's it's coming probably within two years. Um, that, that, that seems pretty, uh, undeniable at this point. Um, and all of that is, is conditional on him following through on agreements he made, uh, with Russia on, on the union state back in the 1990s. What can we expect in the next couple months in Belarus? Would you think more protests and violence or will the country just eventually move back to back to business as normal and quiet down there? I think the protests will start to peter out. I don't think they will ever completely go away. They're, they're an opposition <clears throat> culture has formed. It will be very difficult to get rid of. And there will be no return to normal. Uh, yes. Lukashenko's legitimacy is basically conditional on, on uh, verbal Russian support at this point. Uh, and, you know, his his strength of the security services, the police, the military, uh, the Belarusian uh, parliament, all the political elite, which which continue to, to back him. But uh, if Russia did suddenly turn off that support, uh, they might follow suit. Yeah. Um, the um, Russia is actually very despite the, the 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 rhetoric and propaganda to the contrary russia is very loath to be seen as meddling in any other country's affairs and their position on this is if the belarusian central election commission said that lukashenko is the president by 80 percent eh, but who are we to say otherwise because if we did and we supported someone else that would be seen as us maneuvering him out of power as an interference in belarusian political affairs and we've got a bunch of other people in uh, of other countries in the collective security treaty organization in the commonwealth of independent states in the eurasian economic union that would be rightly justifiably concerned if we were deciding uh, maneuvering a president of one of the countries of these organizations out, if the U S and the EU are seen as meddling and deciding who is a leader of another country, that's normal. Okay. But it's not normal for Russia and it's not the type of relationship they have within the countries in their economic and political blocks. So because of this potential danger to Russian international relations within their own Eurasian area, they don't want to be seen as overtly uh, uh, moving Lukashenko out of power. At the same time, they are worried about that, you know, support for Lukashenko by Russia at this time may move a lot of the Belarusian people to an anti-Russian uh, political opinion that they don't currently have. So they're trying to play a very delicate middle ground where they're tepidly supporting Lukashenko, while kind of with a wink and nod and say, well, change will come. It'll just be under better conditions in the, the near to medium future. Yeah. You know, you have all these other NGOs that go into these other countries to monitor their elections and they're from the West and we can't even have good elections over here. So who's who knows what to think, uh, you know, uh, and also the the tactic of keeping people off the ballots is a big tactic. A lot of these, you know, regime change leaders or or anybody who runs a country head of state will practice. So therefore, you know, they'll eliminate the competition. So the election results might be fair and stuff. But what you did before the elections, allowing people on the ballots and stuff, that is unfair. Uh, well, Lukashenko is actually stuck in that that hard and rock what, place. What right now. Lukashenko really needed to do was hire Debbie Wasserman Schultz. There you go. <laughs> to come over there and rig things for him because yeah. she could have shown him how it's done in a real democratic country. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just pray for uh, 
for peace in Belarus, and hopefully they find their own way forward. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of sad though in Western. You only hear about you know the head of the state Lukashenko and the opposition who aren't using the greatest tactics we see right now. It's that middle ground, that person who's advocating for peace and telling people to just settle down, and a, a true leader can emerge through that kind of vessel, but yet we don't get to see that because Western media doesn't ever talk about those movements. Uh, and I just hope the people of Belarus find their own way without any of these NGOs kind of forcing their hand uh, on which side to pick. Um, so we'll see in the future. Let's get to the next... Uh, topic right now because I know you're you, I've seen your Twitter and you've been posted about this a lot of people don't know about Azer, Azerbaijan and the Armenian conflict which just broke out both declared martial law in the disputed territory of uh, Nagorno uh, Karabakh did I say it right yes after a military uh, conflict broke out on Sunday uh, tanks firing at each other we heard conflicting reports uh, 16 dead 20 dead uh, Turkey immediately backed Azerbaijan while Russia, a longtime ally of uh, Armenia, correct me if I'm wrong, called for a ceasefire for the two countries to work things out. Give us a little brief history of the two countries and the region, but more importantly, how did we get to this point today uh, with the actions that were taken by the two countries on Sunday? Okay, so um, Armenia and Azerbaijan are two countries in, in the, the Caucasus, Caucasus between the south of Russia, south of Georgia. Uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, right? Mm -hmm. um, Armenia is a landlocked country. It's got a bad history with Turkey, the history of genocide there. Um, and Turkey comprises one part of its border. Its other major border is with uh, Azerbaijan, which is a Turkic country, that it has long had a, a, a bad, uh, bloody history with. Um, and... There's a small sliver of a border with Iran, uh, which actually has completely neutral, uh, even sometimes favorable relations with Armenia, uh, despite the fact that Azerbaijan and Iran are both Shia countries. Uh, Armenia, of course, is uh, uh, Christian Orthodox, uh, like Russia. Um, the history of the Caucasus there, Armenia once had a larger Orthodox kingdom there. There's been division. The Nagorno-Karabakh has been a contested issue going back to the breaking up of the our kingdom of Armenia between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, going, going back that far in history. It's been a long contested area. It's been part of the Armenian, Nagorno-Karabakh has been part of the Armenian kingdom. It's been part of a Turkic Khanate. Uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, it was made an independent city within the Azerbaijani uh, Soviet Socialist Republic. When the Soviet Union started to fall apart, Nagorno-Karabakh is majority ethnic Armenian. They didn't want to be part of Azerbaijan. They wanted to be part of uh, Armenia, but they're a mountainous area stuck in the middle or, or you know, the, the, yeah. they're stuck within the borders of Azerbaijan. I believe Russia told them no, too, right, when they asked if they can be part of Armenia. This is in the 50s or the 60s, I believe. Yeah, I mean, there was there there have been a long thing that the Soviet Union kept them, you know, uh, uh, separate. But there wasn't any type of nationalist issue then. As the Soviet Union fell apart, nationalism arose in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh used the Soviet constitution to secede from the uh, Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic. Azerbaijan didn't accept that. The Soviet Union completely fell apart and a war broke out uh, and some 20,000 people died in that war. Um, that was between 1988 and 1994, six years. Armenia got the better side of that conflict. Now, Russia has always kept officially tried to keep the peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It actually has good relations with both countries. It sells arms to both countries. Um, it is, however, seen more as both historically uh, and today as a guarantor of Armenian sovereignty and safety. There is still a Russian military base in Armenia. It's near the border with Turkey and it's kept by Armenia. 
uh, being seen as preventing you know, further Turkish aggression against Armenia. And Turkey has recently aggressed against every one of their other neighbors. Uh, so uh, with the whole history of genocide and everything there, Armenia has, has good reason to fear. Um, as from, the, as from the Armenian point of view and the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, they feel themselves to be Armenian. They don't want to be part of um, uh, Azerbaijan's Azerbaijan. self-determination. Yeah. From the point of Azerbaijan, they have an ethnic minority enclave within the borders of their country that is separatist, that doesn't want to be part of their country, and identifies and is ethnically composed of their major enemy and historical enemy next door. Uh, so they see it as returning control over their whole territory. As a result of the, uh, the uh, war that ended in 94, a peace was brokered by Russia um, that was favorable to Armenia. A line of contract was drawn basically within Azerbaijan uh, along the lines of Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, keeping Nagorno-Karabakh uh, an ethnic Armenian enclave outside of Azerbaijani government control and allowing, you know, complete ease of resupply uh, uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, by Armenia. It was a very unfavorable. Azerbaijani population doesn't like this. Nationalist sentiment is really high in Azerbaijan right now. There were big protests in Baku this summer and the, the quarantine, the coronavirus quarantine, start the war. That was, that was what the people, the protesters in Baku were saying. They want what they view as rightfully within the borders of their country back under their control. They want the line of contact gone. Um, and it is, it, is not so, it is not really a religious thing. It's not uh, Orthodox Christian versus Shia Muslim. It is more about nationalism. And both Azerbaijan and Turkey, which is full-throatedly supporting Azerbaijan now. They're both Turkic peoples. They both have uh, questionable economic circumstances right now. And they're using this nationalism and Turkey's foreign policy adventures in Syria and Iraq and Libya with Greece and the Mediterranean and now with Azerbaijan. Um, Turkey has offered its full-throated support to Azerbaijan. It's the only country that is taking a side right now. Every other country, Russia, the EU, the US, China, Iran, everyone else in the world is saying, stop fighting both of you. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, knock heads together, see some sense, uh, because there's no way this ends not through dialogue that doesn't, you know, a pro-Azerbaijani position would mean ethnic cleansing or genocide of Nagorno-Karabakh. That's the only way for them to gain real control of this area left. That's not really an option, uh, or it shouldn't be. We, we, we hope it isn't. But that doesn't bother Erdogan, right? Um, he's playing to his uh, neo-Ottoman nationalist and Islamist base, and he's pushing uh, support for Azerbaijan. Reportedly, yeah. and these are credible reports, he has sent some 4,000 of his Islamist jihadi proxies yeah, it's all over your from Twitter. the Syrian conflict uh, to uh, uh, Azerbaijan to support the offensive now to, to take Nagorno-Karabakh uh, for Azerbaijan. Well, uh, well, I got a question though, real quick. Will Erdogan receive any backlash for this from the West? I mean, you know, is, is this just simple, normal Erdogan behavior uh, of Turkey oppressing Armenia. I mean, it's just uh, at what point? <laughs> I mean, we this is a NATO ally sending jihadists <laughs> across across another country to fight. Is he going to receive any backlash from the West whatsoever? What, why the West was backing jihadists in Syria, <laughs> including I mean, I the same we would ones that something and we would start speaking same, up against this shit. The same I people mean, that Erdogan is sending now to fight. You know, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, it's not confirmed yet. But in Azerbaijan, those same people used to be backed by the U.S. and the EU. In Syria, yeah. <laughs> with Timber Sycamore in, in Syria. Syria. So, yeah. And they're not even defending Greece right now, which is crying for support uh, as, as Turkey uh, threatens naval confrontation and tries to seize energy rights off the Cyprus coast. Uh, Cyprus was recently... 
holding up sanctions in the EU against Belarus, said we'll support sanctions there as long as you help us against Turkey here, which the EU isn't doing. And why? Erdogan has long played this goal. He's very good at it. He's a cunning beast of hedging his bets between the U.S., the West, NATO on one side and Russia on the other. And both sides are so afraid of permanently losing him to the other that no one criticizes him. No one uh, you know, really calls him out. Russia is effectively at war with him in both Syria and Libya already. But they maintain economic normal relationships with him and, and fake frenemy smiles because of the whole geopolitical balance thing. Even as this geopolitical conflict with Russia that started in Syria continues there, moved to Libya, and now Erdogan is really hoping to gain concessions from Russia in Syria for its a de facto annexation of North Syria and populating it, removing the Kurds and repopulating it with Turkmen and, and other Islamists. He's hoping to gain concessions there from playing around in what is seen as Russia's Caucasus backyard in this Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. And I don't think there's any question, right? Azerbaijan and Armenia have plenty of reasons to hate each other. Azerbaijan has, you know, from its perspective, legitimate reasons to want Nagorno-Karabakh back. But Erdogan is goading this along. And this was obviously prepared for months now. In the, the recent UN General Assembly speeches, both Erdogan and uh, Aliyev, the president of uh, Azerbaijan, had really sharply directed speeches against Armenia, calling them a destabilizing factor. They've obviously been preparing this offensive probably for months now, since the last much smaller outbreak of fighting in July. And, uh, you know, Again, Turkey is playing for a, its domestic base. It's got neo-Ottoman foreign ambitions, and it's it's hoping to use this as further leverage against Russia in Syria and Libya. It's a really cynical, nasty piece of work, but that's Erdogan all Erdogan. over. His goons beat up a bunch of Americans when they were over here. Uh, I'm US surprised said they haven't. Nothing. What's that? <laughs> And the U.S. government said nothing. Nothing. Obama's government said nothing. <laughs> nothing. Uh, what, I, it's, we, we obviously see that Erdogan is playing, has got a part to play when it comes to Russia, especially with this conflict with Armenia and Azerbaijan. What does this mean for the West, and what should we do in this conflict? Once again, just stay out? Or should we speak up? And uh, I mean, I know we should speak up against Erdogan, but we're not gonna, but... What does no, this actually okay. mean for the West, Mark? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in a hypothetical, unlikely, but theoretically possible worst case scenario. Okay, Armenia and Azerbaijan escalate to full scale war, not just over this enclave, but against each other across each other's borders. Armenia has is part of the collective security treaty organization with Russia. It appeals to its equivalent of Article 5 treaties under there to call Russia to its defense from Azerbaijan. As long as it's just Nagorno-Karabakh, that doesn't apply. But if they start fighting across their main border, then Armenia has every right to call Russia and the rest of the collective security treaty organization to come to their assistance. Turkey then comes to the assistance of Azerbaijan, and their rhetoric already has them there uh, by a high degree. Turkey is a member of NATO. Now, our, now, whatever NATO thinks of Erdogan and would like him to disappear, having a NATO member and a geopolitically crucial pivot point for control of the Middle East and the Caucasus, Turkey, being at war with Russia uh, and the Collective Security Treaty Organization is something that NATO simply couldn't stand by, even though it wouldn't technically fit under Article 5, NATO would, would likely intervene as well. And from there, we've gone from a small local conflict that everyone basically wishes would just go away to a possible World War I type alliance pulling different countries in type scenario. And you see how serious this has the potential to be. Now, nobody wants that. Russia doesn't want to get involved in this conflict. Russia wants